1914. The shot of Sarajevo could be heard across the world. Trenches are lined across France, becoming the main way of warfare for the next four years. Meanwhile, 7,000 kilometers away, someone has given birth. The woman in question, and I'll try to say this correctly, is Ma Parwar Bejum. Her husband is an Afghan prince, Mohammed Nadir Shah. He would do a lot of things in his life. He would lead the Afghan National Army against the British, he was the Afghan ambassador to France, and would rule Afghanistan as king for four years. But that is yet to happen. Because this story isn't about the father or the mother. This story is about Mohammed Zaire Shah. And it's here, on his birth, where our story begins. Very little could be said about Zaheer Shah before his coronation. He went to school in Afghanistan and later in France, and similar to his father, he became a diplomatic envoy for Afghanistan and France, only to return to Afghanistan to help his family reassert power, now that Afghanistan is a liberated nation. He would become the deputy war minister and the minister of education. Now life was going pretty well for Zaheer Shah, but when he was 19, Something happened. 1933. The Great Depression was at its lowest point, and in November, tragedy struck in Afghanistan. Zahir's father was visiting a high school, but then one Abdul Khalik shot him during the graduation ceremony. And so, on the 8th of November, 1933, because the school year ended in November in that school, Zahir Shah was now king of Afghanistan. A winner is you. His first order of business was opening up relations with the outside world. Though it would join the League of Nations, during World War II, Afghanistan was closer to the Axis. However, Zahir Shah refused to join the war, wanting to stay neutral in what would become a deadly conflict. They had other matters to deal with anyway, because in the mid-1940s, the Afghans had to deal with tribal revolts in the East. No one could really agree with why it happened. But regardless, there is now a revolt. How well did it go? And... Not that great. Mazrak, leader of the Zanjan tribe, tried to do some damage from Sirkot but he was forced to retreat to the hills. And to make sure this conflict didn't go too far, British Raj, under the request of Afghanistan, made sure its neighboring tribes wouldn't join in this. Masra continued to fight until the end of 1947. There was also a Safi uprising around the same time, and it became a bigger problem to the Afghans. They even looted the government treasury, only for the Safi leaders to flee the British Raj in 1945 or 46. After that, he decided that his second order of business would be to modernize Afghanistan, since it's been lagging behind the other parts of the world. During Shah's reign, one of the things he did was make a new constitution, creating a parliament with free elections and giving women's rights. So life was going pretty well for Zahir Shah. His nation can finally grow into a potential world power. But now, let's get to the interesting part. The part that defined his reign outside of Afghanistan. How his reign ended. July 17th, 1973. The Americans left Saigon. The Twin Towers have completed construction a few months ago. And several hundred Afghans had arrived in Kabul. But these Afghans didn't coincidentally arrive together. They were going to overthrow the monarch. Remember that new parliament government that Shah established? Yeah, it didn't go so great. Five different government cycles have already passed, and all of them sucked. There was also a famine in the northwest. So by 1973, people started hating the Afghan government, as well as the one responsible. And at the top, the man leading this coup d'etat was Shah's cousin, 
Mohammed Duit Khan. Now I could dedicate a whole episode to this guy, but basically during his early life, he served as a governor of some provinces before becoming a commander in the tribal revolts, and he was appointed prime minister in 1953. What made him different from Zahir Shah was his beliefs. While Shah refused to take sides, Khan was a bit more extreme. He was a Pashtun, which was the major race in Afghanistan, even to this very day. Another country that has Pashtuns is Pakistan, but only in the Northwest. Khan wanted it, so when Pakistan and India got their independence from the British in 1947, Khan began to mobilize troops to the Durand Line, the international border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, so he could unify the Pashtuns under the same country. I've seen this one. I've seen this one. This is a classic. So when he created the parliamentary system a decade after the fact, he rejected Khan from joining office because he really didn't want to go through that political mess again. But when that parliamentary system blew up in Shah's face, Khan knew that it was his time to shine. So he, the Afghan military, and some of his followers went to overthrow Zahir Shah. Your lackluster reign over this country is over. Wait, where did he go? Dear Duit Khan, I went to go fix my eyes and I might stick around Europe for a bit afterwards. I'll be back later. Sincerely, Sahir Shah. Hmm. Yes, this was the only joke I could make in this video. So with no lives lost, Khan proclaims himself as the first president of the Republic of Afghanistan. Hearing this, Zahir Shah starts to think. He was faced with one truth. If he returned home, they would surely kill him. But Zahir Shah didn't want to fight it out. He didn't want to go against the people of his country. And if the people of his country don't want a monarch anymore, if the Afghan people truly wanted a republic, then that's fine with him. In August 1973, Shah sent an abdication letter from Rome to Kabul. Khan got the message, and Shah was officially, voluntarily, exiled. So Shah stayed in Rome with his wife, in a small apartment, might I add. But to be honest, it wasn't that bad. And for the next five years, Khan would send money to Shah and his family based on the property they had back in Afghanistan. So life, once again, was pretty well for Zahir Shah. But as Shah continued to chill in Italy, this time permanently, things were happening in Afghanistan. And I think you know how the rest of the story goes. The Republic would be overthrown by the communists in 1978. Islamic fighters would rebel against the communists in 1979 causing the Soviets to invade. The Islamic fighters, backed up by the United States and China, would be back against the Soviets. The communist government would then collapse. And by 1992, Afghanistan was in an interesting position. Afghanistan was now a bunch of squabbling Islamic factions. However, many Afghans wanted Shah back as king. The Mujahideen, who ruled these factions, even considered this idea but because of intervention from Pakistan, it never went anywhere. The last bit of hope for peace in Afghanistan had finally been snuffed out, and Shah wouldn't return. Ed. And then all of a sudden, I, I thought it sounded kind of lo um, louder, then I looked up, and all of a sudden it smashed right dead into the center of the World Trade Center. Oh my goodness. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. It would appear that there has been another major explosion, this one in the nation's capital. April 2002. Everyone had their eyes on Afghanistan. Shah had learned about the catastrophe that happened on that fateful day. And so, with the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban now gone into hiding, 
Sean knew that it was time to go home. He was welcomed and celebrated by everyone when he returned home to see the man that brought some amount of peace to Afghanistan. He could have become president of Afghanistan, but he was given the job chief of state, a job he was content to have. So yet again, life was going pretty well for Zahir Shah. But that would be for the last time. After getting injured in a French bathroom, don't question it, he was sent to the hospital after breaking a bit of his leg. He was 87 or 88 at the time. He would bounce around between hospitals until July 23rd, 2007, when Zahir Shah, the last king of Afghanistan, sadly passed away. Zahir Shah would have the longest reign as king in the dynasty. He wouldn't be the best king of Afghanistan. That honor went to his ancestor, Ahmad Shah Durrani, the guy who started the Durrani dynasty. But his reign would be remembered in nostalgia, a time when Afghanistan wasn't a giant war zone. But that time is slowly drifting deeper and deeper into history as the years slowly go by. And so, Afghanistan began to plunge deeper and deeper into darkness as the Taliban continued to fight with the U.S. over Afghan supremacy. That is, until recently.